Uh, so I'm Antonio Cabrales, and, and I'm going to talk about experiments in the, in the core approach. I think I'm going to do the, the low-tech version, and then Umberto is going to talk about the high-tech uh, version of these things. Um, so in terms of what we're doing, um, then I'll first give a little bit of motivation, then a brief roundup of technologies, and then what experiments do I do and what other experiments are there in the, in the core uh, kind of platform. Okay, so first thing is um, it's, we do experiments because it's in line with the core evidence-based approach. We pay a lot of attention to this. And I think it's very important for the students, but also for, the, for us uh, to believe. So part, part of, the, of the problem with other approaches to teaching economics is that evidence is just brushed aside as something that will come later. It's kind of a secondary issue in some ways, and, and we, for us, it's central. Um, the one big advantage of this is it lends credibility when you, when, when you teach some things. Uh, oftentimes, economists are not, uh, teaching things to students. They come out of the course believing, and in fact, there's, there's good evidence about this, that people come out of the course having the same beliefs. They enter the course. They've learned some things, but they thought they weren't true, and therefore they, they brush them aside. It's much harder to do it when you're presented the evidence over and over. So credibility, I think, it's crucial in these things. Um, I think, more importantly, uh, this, these two other things sort of come hand in hand. It's just more fun to do it. I, I taught uh, introductory economics for, for a long time, first when I first arrived at Pompeo Fabra, and then also in Carlos III, and I would just Dying. I mean, the, the old the old approach just just you know made me just almost commit suicide there. Um, and uh, this had to bring back to life uh, teaching. And part of it is uh, it's also much easier to focus and remember when what you're doing is sort of interesting. And I think that's going to be important for the students. Okay. So in terms of technologies, uh, you can do experiments in various ways. Uh, so. Earlier, uh, we were told of a class of 260. My, hundred, my class is 350. Uh, so you can imagine that there, that poses challenges. Handrun experiments uh, are really good for small groups. And I still do one, because I really want to do one that I know works, works well. But in a, in a big class, that's not, import, I mean, that's not possible. But if you're in a small group, they're really, really good. The hand and experiments. Uh, it, it gives a it gives us a different sense to the to what you're doing. Um, I use uh, one of these clicker instant polling technology, Eco 360. Many UK universities have it, you know, for their for their lectures for free, and it's useful because you can do both experiments and I mean, with what it was designed for, which is just doing quizzes in class. And I do both quizzes and experiments. Doing quizzes is also useful because it gives you a sense of whether people are following you. So I do three or four quizzes every, every lecture. And at some points, uh, I realize that they haven't learned anything and I have to go back a bit. That's, that's useful. Sometimes they, they learn well and, and it shows. So, so that, that's very useful in general. Um, Classics is uh, it's another platform that uh, Umberto is going to talk about. There's another good platform for doing games, uh, experiments. It's called Economics Games. Uh, you can use any of them, and th those are all quite useful for various things. Um, so experiments that I do, which is the, the third part. So the, the first experiment that I do in class, the so first day of class, before they do anything, they do the market experiments. Um, this is a, a way to represent the market experiment. You give students cards. So it's black cards represent demand. Red cards represent supply. Uh, each card that each uh, student has has a number. So if, if uh, you're a supplier and your card has a one, this means that your cost of producing the good is one. You o only you know the card. No one else sees it. Same thing for the people under demand. So a six means the maximum, that your, your maximum value that you're prepared to pay for the good. Uh, so everyone has either a red card or a black card, and, and, and everyone knows whether who is, uh, uh, because the cards are red on the two sides. So if you have a red card that is you know, hidden the number, but everyone knows that you're red, they know that you're uh, a seller. And if you have a black card on the outside, but also on the inside, they, everyone knows that you're a buyer. 
people just have to go around the room. Just, you just picture yourself this room with 350 uh, students in which everyone is running around trying to find a buyer, trying to find a seller, trying to make a deal. Notice that, for example, if you're uh, a buyer and you have a, a card three, so you're a you know, low valuation buyer, it's going to be very difficult to find someone that wants to exchange with you. So you'll be running around saying, you know, I want you to sell, sell me an object, and how much are you willing to pay? You look at your card and say, two. Well, that's not going to sit very well. Say, I'm sorry, two is, uh, for many people, actually, it would be impossible to sell at two. Some people out down here might be able to sell at two, but it's very difficult. You have to find them. So the, the spectacle of all these kids running around, talking very loud in the first day of class, it's, it's kind of uh, good. But possibly more importantly, uh, once you do it, uh, I mean, the, this you know, is a, a market. It has an equilibrium. There's a prediction for this. Of course, at that point, they don't know anything about this. All they know is they have a card, and they have to find someone else to try to exchange for the maximum possible difference. These people are very happy. Uh, these people down here are less happy, but, but that's just life. Um, <laughs> so that's the experiment. That's the prediction that we're making. Of course, they don't know that at the time. Uh, but the fun part comes when, when, you, uh, when you explain what's, what's going on. So, oh. Uh, by the way, the, the, you can also do this with the instant polling technology. You can use it at the same time because the, in the old days, uh, we would go, we would have a, a TA, maybe Gonzalo has done it, I don't remember, uh, just Christian. taking note. Christian certainly has, has you know, you, you're here and a, two people come and they say, we've, we've done a, a trade at three, and then you would write a three in the whiteboard. Or someone else and comes and says, it's a, it's a seven. And you start writing things on the whiteboard, and they start seeing it. Uh, and it's, you know, you, they see you know, in, in real time what's, what's going on. And it's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, very soon, you'll see that, that although there are, these, are, these are for experiments we ran at, at Carlos III when, when I was uh, teaching before. And these are averages for individual groups. So the, num the actual numbers themselves can be all over the place. You have eights, and you have sixes, and you have 3.5. Um, but the average in the groups, uh, and these are groups typically there were 13, 15 people, they end up being pretty close to the market prediction. In a large class of, of, uh, of 350, it's just spot on. You, you actually do get the equilibrium. And I think Umberto has even more uh, experience because he's done it for relatively middle-sized groups and for many more of them for many years. And I'm, I'm sure you'll get it. And everyone does this experiment, you get the same experience. People do get the equilibrium. So that's the first experiment. It's lots of fun. And, and then if you could do more of this. In a class of 350, doing many, you know, many days of this would be. But you can do things. I mean, you can. Uh, try to see if people collude by allowing you know, uh, some of them to form groups. You can uh, do monopoly experiments in which just one individual controls all the supply. And, and you, you, know, you can do taxes, you can do uh, subsidies, you, know, you name it, it can be done with this experiment. It can also be done with instant polling technology, at least at the part of just reporting your, uh, your prices. And we've, done, we've tried that as well. OK, so that's, that's the first experiment. Now, what kinds of things do we learn? Uh, so you know, first obvious uh, thing is that the theory works even beyond the theoretical assumptions. Because the theoretical assumptions that you explain is there have to be many buyers, many sellers, perfect, perfect information. When you do this in a group of 15 people, there are not that many buyers, not that many sellers. Information is certainly not perfect, yet you get something that the theory tells you. Uh, but it also tells you when it fails. Uh, if you do it just once with, without repetition, it's less likely that you get a very good uh, uh, you know, uh, theoretical uh, benchmark. And the public display is also needed. If you didn't have all these prices going on, then, uh, then you wouldn't get the, the actual outcome. So do you run it without public display as well? We run, we run it with, oh, we don't run it without public display, but it's been run with, without public display. And then, I mean, you, you could try it as well, and then you wouldn't get the equilibrium. Then, it shows the value of the marketplace. 
Yeah, exactly. No, no. It, it shows it shows that that institutions are needed. It's that the, that the theory would work. Something needs to happen for the theory to work. And and there is a there is the the there is this motto that that we always follow in the in the course that. Uh, rules of the game matter, uh, and that's one obvious way in which the rules of the game matter. Repetitions are needed, public displays are needed, so, so that brings home one of the key themes that, that we follow through the course. Uh, and, you know, that's, you know, take home too. The rules of the game under which we interact matter, and they matter a lot, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an important consideration here. It's also important in the first day to tell students it's a capital mistake to theorize without data and the experimental method gives good data. So when later on we do more experiments, they know, ah, that's why we're doing more experiments. It's not because the guy wants to have fun and, and wants NSS scores to improve, which of course we do, but, but in addition to this, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just a good practice. And, and then because we can use, we are going to use the model later to tell them what happens when you do taxes and when you have subsidies and so on. It's, you need a good model in order to have good policy. So it's important to have a, a good benchmark in order to do things. So there's a bunch of nice things that happen when you do the experiment and people feel it uh, in a way that they wouldn't feel it in their blood if, if it wasn't for the experiment. And Antonio, you, you, you run the experiment Nothing. So it's just the they arrive. They arrive. It's more chaos. It gets more chaotic with this going on. But there's no kind of preamble. Nothing. Just start playing. Um, okay, so that's the first thing we do. Um, another experiment that I do, uh, it's, it's the public goods game. That comes a little later. I think it's in, in, uh, already in, uh, in Unit 4. And and that's the design is relatively simple. It could be if you were running it in a in a I do it in a in a in a big group. If you if you had a, a small group, you could have let's say a group of ten randomly matched students. I do it with with the full three hundred and fifty. Each student is given an amount of money, and the game that you play is the following. So each student, in in secret and without communicating with other, you put uh, an integer in number in the. Um, you mention an integer number in a, and you put them in a box. Uh, each one keeps for him or herself whatever amount they did not put in the box. And the amount in the box is multiplied by four and then divided equally among all group members uh, and given to them. Notice that for every pound that you give, 0 .4, uh, 0 0.4 comes back to you and 0 0.4 to each, of, to each of the other participants. So that, that, those are the simple instructions. And then uh, in the large group, with this instant polling technology, you, you, you ask the student, how much, if you were in that 10-person group, how much would you put in the box? And then they just click on, on one of the numbers. And uh, the one that we use, as I said, is equal 360, the same one that we, that we used to do any of the quizzes that I do in class. <coughs> and then, you know, they just click on a number. Okay? That's, that's all they have to do. And then the advantage of the instant polling technology is that then uh, once people decide what to do, then you can show them what the answers were. So everyone responds, and that's a typical answer that they would give in my class. 34% uh, give the total amount, which actually leads you to the uh, kind of Pareto superior outcome. 25% go to the minimum, and there's a bunch of things in the middle. That's relatively representative of things that happen in class. Um, okay, so we do it, but again, uh, we do it for a reason. We can explain that uh, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, you know, is one of the people that started thinking about why is it that in a public good context, sometimes you get good results and sometimes you don't, and there's, there's a whole lot of things that already the immediately there you can start explaining. Uh, but the, the principal uh, thing that, we're, that we show them is we show them what this kind of experiment uh, results are produced elsewhere. So we have a slide when we show results all over the world for this kind of experiment. Um, we, it can also be used to, uh, to, to show that rules of the game matter. Uh, we show the results, and it's also in the book, the results of the game 
with punishment. Uh, what happens if, in addition to these rules, you could spend a little bit of your cash punishing people that don't behave nicely. And you see what, what uh, you, you can show them what this uh, entails. And you can use the, the results to motivate uh, reciprocal altruism. You can see that the results, if you repeat the, this game several times, you'll see a declining pattern in contributions. And, and that's very useful to say, uh, how people's work. So if you then can introduce a model in which people are altruistic, they're, they're willing to give part of things that belong to them to, so that others' uh, benefits increases. But if other people don't behave the same way, then, then you start also not, doing, uh, not contributing yourself. So it, it can be used for a class in which you expand on the, on the lessons from that single experiment. Okay, other experiment that, that I do is the, the ultimatum game. Uh, when there is a social dilemma, people may sit and talk. So that's, we, we explain from the very beginning, the first day we talk about uh, climate change. We also talk about how ways to solve the climate change. And we've explained to them the Kyoto Protocol uh, many classes ago. So we can go back to the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol and say, so we need to understand how people negotiate. And, and, and like the one you did, because in class they've already done. So the first day they were doing a negotiation. So the, the market experiment is a negotiation experiment. So what we're trying to explain to them here is what happens in a more uh, standardized negotiation agreement with a particular protocol. And that's the protocol. So let's say Anne and Betty find a 10 pound note in the street and they play the following game to divide the note. Anne proposes to give, give Betty an integer amount between zero and 10 and, and Anne keeps the rest. And Betty says yes or no to the proposal. If, they, if, Anne, uh, if Betty says uh, yes, the proposal is implemented. If Betty uh, say, says no, the 10 pounds stay in the street. That's the game. That's the ultimatum game. And they can, and then you can elicit their behavior in this experiment. You can tell them, if you were Anne, how much would you propose? And they can say anything between 0 and 10, and then they can click on a number uh, in, the, in the instant polling technology. And then you can also, you ask, uh, if you were Betty, what's your minimal acceptable offer? Hmm? So it's the offer below which you wouldn't accept. Uh, and then. With just two clicks, you get the results of the experiment. Uh, and then with these two clicks, you can show them. And again, you can use this, the results, and then compare what they're doing with the results elsewhere. And usually, you will get results that, I mean, this is a class of undergraduate students. You can show them, this is what undergraduate students do. This is what people that are not undergraduate students will get. Typically, they do similar to their undergraduate students elsewhere. Now, that's very useful because this is a very specific game in extensive form. It's one of the simplest games you could find in extensive form. So immediately, if you've participated in a game in extensive form, how would you go about modeling a game in extensive form? So you can use this to motivate and model uh, extensive form games. Um, and also, you can use to motivate model uh, a spiteful or uh, uh, norm or norm norm based preferences. So just like you use public goods to motivate altruistic reciprocal altruism, you can uh, use this to motivate another kind of model. So it's doing models after you have data. I think that's one of the cr crucial things that one can learn from experiments. Okay, uh, experiment another experiment that I do, and it's probably the last one, I don't want to spend too much time on this, uh, is, the, is the Nash Demand game. So that's a different kind of negotiation game. It's a game in which, again, Anne and Betty find a 10 pound note in the street, and they play the following game to divide the, to divide the, the note. Anne proposes an amount for her to keep. Betty proposes an amount for her to keep. If the sum of the amount is lower than or equal to 10 pounds, each one gets what she proposed. And if the sum of the amounts is bigger than 10 pounds, both get nothing. Okay? That's, a, that's a different kind of game. It's, it's very different uh, in structure from the uh, ultimatum game. Uh, and it also gives different results. Uh, it's also very use, uh, uh, easy to implement in the, in, with the instant polling technology. Everyone has to say, uh, 
Oops, uh, I think this is a different question. So I wanted to, to plot here, but here it would be just the same as before. Um, this is another question, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, ah, I think it, the, the reason why this came up is uh, with the instant polling, you can ask what, they're, what, they're, what they would do, but you can also ask them what are equilibria for this game. At the point where, where they reach this game, they already know about equilibria of the game. And I can ask them, which of these things is an equilibrium of the game that they just played. So, so it can, it, you can do both. You can ask them uh, both what you would do and what is equilibrium for this game. And that's very interesting because it, it, it gives you an idea of whether they've understood the game and whether they've understood what an Ash equilibrium is. I won't ask you which one of these is an Ash equilibrium. Um, anyway, so... Uh, that's also a useful game because, again, it, it shows that, that the rules of the game matter, and they matter a lot. You'll get a very different result here. Uh, although the game has, and it, it's useful because this is a game in which essentially anything in the Pareto Frontier, any split of the pie that, that adds up to 10, is an Ash equilibrium of this game. Yet, absolutely everyone in all the classes that I've taught goes for the 5-5. Five five. Everyone says a 5-5. Five five. Whereas in the ultimatum game, there's a range of answers, uh, even though there's a unique equilibrium. Here, there's many equilibrium, and you get just one answer. Uh, so it, it tells you something about how we select equilibrium, how we, you coordinate, and so on. And, and, uh, uh, and it tells you that the rules of the game matter a lot. So contrasting the two, especially if you do them, the, both of them in the same class, is very useful for them to understand the concept of equilibrium, but also the limitations of the concept of equilibrium, and so on. Okay, uh, just to finish, uh, what other experiments are there? You will find in the, in the materials for, for lectures, you have a bunch of uh, other experiments, not that many, but have a, a few others. Um, the airplane game, uh, I'm not going to explain it. It's just, it just loads of fun. Uh, you, you, you have students that have to materials for doing a, a, a you know, airplane, a, one of these paper airplanes that you, you throw in the class, and you have uh, to just get the paper, fold it, uh, you have to write something in there, and there are kind of several stages in the production, and, 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 you, and, and you can do it in groups of one, two, three, four, something like this, and then, and then you, you see how the best, I think it's three, and, but then one and, and four are, for different reasons, not, not working very well. I mean, it's really, it's incredibly good for motivating what a production function is. It's not a great game to do in a class with 360, but if you have a class of, let's 40 or 50, it actually works very well. I've seen the videos from uh, the class of Juan Camilo Cárdenas, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's really great. I, I wish I could do it. Um, we also have a, Another uh, experiment, uh, it's an incomplete contract experiment based on the Shapiro and Stiglitz model. Uh, it's, it's, this was actually designed and programmed by one of our students in the second year. It's part of the, we have a, a, a competition, it's called the Explore Econ uh, Conference, and students from second, third year typically just have their own research projects. As a research project, a second year student, just one year after doing the core, um, Mateusz Talinski, uh, just designed this, programmed it, ran it, got the money for, for the run it, ran it, and in, in a, first a pilot at UCL, and then, and then the full game in a, in a, in a Polish uh, high school. Uh, so he just told, told us about this, and it, it's there. It's wonderful for unit C's and labor market, and you know, it, it was amazing. It's just the power of the core. You know, a second year student was so enthused by the first year class that in the second year wanted to design, run, program his own experiment. By the way, he's at the University of Chicago now. If you can get hold of him when he finishes, he's going to be great. Um, so one of my biggest frustration is not to have done a bubble experiment. Uh, both of the platforms that I just mentioned have uh, bubble experiments, and they would be great. I've never done it because I'm a yeah, lazy you know, bum, but, uh, but this is the one that, that I think should be done. We don't have one in there, but, but, there, but it, we should have one in the future. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, i leave you with Umberto.
Okay. Uh, thanks uh, for the for the <coughs> sorry <coughs> for all the explanation that. So I think I think this explanation is quite, this presentation is going to be very complementary to what uh, Antonio said. So it's based on our experience on using experiments in the classroom. Uh, let me just start by a well-known Confucian saying. That's no, it's 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 quote it everywhere. Eh? It's, it says something like, tell me and I forget, show me and I may remember, involve me and I understand, okay? Which is kind of the motto that it's behind of what we do. Uh, a less known quote is this one that says, enjoy in teaching your class and you will have students. It is well known for an obvious reason. Huh? That's mine huh? from last year. Uh, but, but I think it captures something that it's missing in the other one that when we design a classroom, we have to take in consideration students, and we always do. We want to do something that is interesting, that we are going to engage them, but we have to take in consideration the structure as well. So we are going to have to teach this class many times. We are going to have to have somebody or convince somebody to teach this class. If we design a class that it's, the content is extremely interesting, the students are going to have a lot of fun, but I'm going to be bored to death, then it's going to be a bad class. Okay? So what we think is that when we design a course, it might be interesting to attend and it might be interesting to teach. Uh, and we found in experiments a way to mm, engage students and to mm, discover or, or, or rediscover or recover the, the joy of teaching. Okay? And we have done that since 2008 uh, to teach principles of microeconomics. We started until the last two years or three years doing it. Huh? It was all pe pe pen and paper, so by hand. Now we have this new technology that's kind of what I, I, I want to present today. So, of course, we are still huh, in the old Samosonian uh, framework. So, but, but I think it's the methodology, it's the approach, it's, no, it's this instrument that it's not the only one, but it's, but it's there that, I, that it's important and what I want to, hmm, to talk about today. So if at some times I sound a little bit of, you know, as, as, as a marketing hmm, a speaker, so it, read it as, as an invitation hmm, for participating hmm, in core with this, with, this, uh, with this approach. So uh, our triple objective was first and, and, and most importantly to, to engage or to motivate students. And we thought that, it, uh, and I think, huh, well, I, I want to believe that we were successful on that. So second, it was to, to emphasize active learning, okay? And this is hmm, the paper that everybody quotes because I don't think there are many more, but, but this one is one that shows evidence that if you, that active learning really motivates the students and really uh, affects, uh, improves hmm, their, their understanding. And third, it was the idea of maintaining rigorousness and high standards, okay? So I think there is a risk, and, and this is just a, maybe a, no, a gratuitous uh, statement, but I think we, there is a little bit of a risk of transforming the classes, or of, of making the classes a little bit childish. Mm? So we've introduced a lot of games, a lot of fun, and so on. So it's good to have fun, it's good to enjoy it, but that's not the purpose. Huh? That, that, should be, that should be a mean. So let me go uh, directly to, to what we do. So the methodology we use is a methodology that what we do is we start with an experiment. Hmm? So in the sense, so I don't have to say that much, because, uh, much about that because Antonio already told that. So, so the, first day, the first day of class is introduction. This is how, no, structure of the course and so on. But the first class is really an experiment. Hmm? So the class we have, so we do the experiments in the seminars or the sections, and then we have, we have the theory, okay? So, but the, the first day is an experiment. They don't know anything about what they expect. Hmm? So the first experiment is actually the, uh, we combine two experiments. Hmm? So one is the, the, the market experiment, hmm? supply and demand. And then we do a second one that is the fish market that I will, I will talk a little bit about it uh, a bit more later. Okay, so after the experiments, students have to work on the experiment. We haven't done any theory yet. We haven't told them anything. So after the experiments, we get data, we give them the data and we did give them uh, assignment, mm, so exercises, that they are constructive exercises. So they have to work on it and they have to struggle. Mm. 
Mm? And that's the idea. I think the important thing is they work on it and they don't find everything. So they struggle, they have to find things. So some parts are very easy, other parts are a little bit more difficult. And then at the end, once they have a struggle, they have thought about it and they have experienced in the first time the situation, then we go to the, to the structures class. Mm? So ideally, I would love the structures class to be a class where we work mm, and, and do more active learning. Unfortunately, my structures class is 200 people, so active learning is, is, is a little bit more challenging, so it becomes a bit more of an old style mm, type of lecturing, but with, the, with two advantages. So the, feta, the first advantage is, is that I can go faster on many things because the students have already gone through it. Second, for the students, I think it allows them to disconnect at the right time. So every student disconnects in the classroom, but when to disconnect is important. So if I go through the exercises and these parts, I already know them, okay, this part I can disconnect, but when there is something I have a struggle and I have a problem with it, and this, the instructor, the professor is starting to talk about it, then I rapidly connect because this is something that I'm curious to know how to do it. Okay, so, so that's, that's important. So the general structure is first we experience the situation. So I've been a seller, I've been a buyer, I've been a monopolist or I've been a demander under a monopoly situation. Second, I research and I discover and I think it's, it's the ideal is that the students really discover the, or they find the, the, the results rather than we present them. And finally, we help, and in particular, we help them in the abstraction and the generalization and more the model and the math and give them examples on how to move from the experiments to, to real life. So how do we do that? Hmm? So in the past it was uh, pen and paper. Right now what we use is, is classics. Okay, so classics, uh, it's one of the platforms, so I think it has a lot of advantages, perhaps because I've used it a lot and we've collaborated closely. So classics is a, is a platform uh, created by uh, the University of Passau in Germany, and, and it has three things that I like. So first is freeware. Mm? So the, uh, you just mm, uh, sign as an instructor, you show your credentials, and then you have access to classics. Mm? That's all you need. Uh, second, it's flexible. Mm? Flexible in the sense that you can use the experiments that are already there, and I'll show you mm? all the, 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 the amount of experiments. I don't know all of them. Mm? So you can use the experiments that are there. You can modify existing experiments, mm? of course, uh, the, or you can create your own experiments from scratch, mm? and, and everything is there. Of course, the more you move hmm, in this list, the more involved you have to get and the more you have to learn, right? But, but you could just use the experiments hmm, that, are, that are in classics. And, and finally, it gives real feedback from the professor to the students and the students to a student. Hmm? So and I'll show you some, some, of, the, some of the examples. Uh, the other thing interesting for classics is that you don't need the students to register. Mm? So it's, we've seen some, some other examples here. Mm? So it's, the students just go, huh, and I will try to do that. So go to, to, to a web page, you give them a, a password, they enter into the experiment, you start the experiment, and you can choose whether you want to do it anonymous or you want to keep track of your students. So for example, in our case, we keep track of them. Mm? We give them, uh, we use mm, not their real names, a code that they have, mm? so actually it's part of the university number, because we want to track the participation in order to use the incentive, to incentivize participation, putting part of the grade, depending on the results of the, of the experiments. Okay, so let me give you, uh, so what we want to create or what we are working hmm? and, and what we think it could be uh, a good way also to, to collaborate with core. And, and let me talk about the, the fish market. So the fish market, and I think for this it could be better if we go to uh, here, uh, not this one. So I think it's easier this way. Okay. So for each one of these experiments, and this is kind, so this is the the experiment for which we have the whole package because it's the presentation of what we want 
what we want to do. For the other ones, everything is there, but hmm, it's not as well presented as, as, as this one. Uh, and I should say, all these experiments are based hmm, on a book by, by uh, uh, Bertrand Miller. Hmm? So we haven't created experiments, huh? we haven't created the material, but we are working uh, with them on the presentation. Uh, and I'll talk huh, about the, the experiments later and the other taxes. So for each experiment, what there, is, hmm, there, is, there is a student manual, there is instructor manual, and then there is all the resources and the complementarities, hmm, uh, the resources uh, in order to be able to teach the class. So for each student, what they will get in the student manual is they will get, well, uh, a general. Hmm, and the idea is that this could be separate. This experiment will have a separate chapter how to use classics, which I'm not going to, and that could be common to all of them, hmm? and they have to know hmm? only one, one of these. But this, in particular, for this experiment, for this, this experiment, everything is structured in before the experiment and after the experiment. So before the experiment, what they have hmm, to know is just what is this experiment about. So, and this experiment is about a fish market, where there are fishers who have come fishing the day before, they had to pay, hmm? and that's what it says, they had to pay hmm? 10 pounds for the, for the fuel and the, hmm? and, and, and the sailors and so on. And now they are in the fish market. Hmm? Buyers, on the other half, they have a buyer value and they have to hmm? maximize profits. Okay? Uh, and then there is this introduction of what they will see. Hmm? So they will see that in their particular session, they will see that they have hmm, how many fish they have. They have one fish. They have to decide what's the price. Hmm? So they have to negotiate what's the price. And then they make an offer, and the other one can accept or reject the offer. OK? Uh, and then there are, hmm, so this is just the, the explanation. And then there are these warm-up exercises, OK? So which are exercises not to Mm, test whether you know the theory or not, is whether you understood the game. Uh, usually the large warm-up exercises is something about what do you expect. Mm, so to make them reflect what do you expect to see to see in this market. Uh, so for the for the warm-up exercises, we use them mm, uh, in order to test also later in the, in, in the experiment, before the experiment, whether they understand hmm, the, the experiment or not. Okay, so let me just, uh, because I think it's going to be easier. Hmm? So I don't know if I have time for everything I wanted to say, but uh, so I think it's up here. Okay, so let me just show you hmm, what classics is about hmm, and what uh, students will, so if we go... to the fish market, hmm? so, and, and the idea is, so I'm already hmm, in the fish market, I'm just creating fictitious players, hmm? and I can start the game. Okay, so I have six players, I start the game, and what I see is that they are, hmm? so these people don't have, these are buyers, and these are sellers, hmm? these are fishers. Okay? So, how does it work in the classroom? So in the classroom, everyone hmm, gets in their phone a picture like this, and this is a replica of exactly what they see in their phone or in their, in their tablet. And if I'm a seller, I see hmm, that I have one fish. And what we do is we ask them to walk around and to negotiate and to find what's the best deal. Hmm? If I'm a seller, what's the best deal? In, in what's the highest price. If I'm a buyer, what's the lowest price I can, I can buy? Okay? Once I find, hmm, once they talk to each other, and for example, I find hmm, I, this seller is talking to this buyer, so this is a buyer who has uh, a value of 25 euros, uh, the seller hmm, has marginal cost zero, hmm, and that we know, but hmm, they don't know. And... Uh, they agree on a particular price. Let's suppose they agree on 12 euros. Hmm? And it says the price is 5. Okay? So sell. Hmm? So the price is 5, the ID, and 
the ID of the other of the buyer is five. So now the buyer receives the offer, and if it accepts the offer, now the fees is gone from the seller. The fees is received to the buyer, but more importantly, the transaction is automatically projected in the screen of the professor. So this is what everybody would see. Hmm? So in this case, the information we have is what was the time of the transaction, what was the buyer and the seller ID, but this ID is specific to each round, so they cannot identify who's this one. This helps for them particularly to know that this is the right thing. They can track their, what's their transaction, but nobody else knows what's this transaction. Here we have the buyer value, and we don't have the seller cost, because here the seller cost is the same for everybody. But in, if it were a supply and demand, we would see the seller cost and what's the price that they make the transaction. Uh, so we can have, so in the particular, in this, in this experiment, we have two different uh, sessions. So in the first session, everybody has one fees. In the second session, everybody, uh, so all the fees, they end up with three fees. Hmm? Uh, and in each session, there is several rounds. Hmm? Here you can do up to three rounds in each session, and you can skip sessions. Hmm? And you, so you can skip rounds by just passing to, to the next one. So once we have done, hmm, suppose there were several, several feedbacks, hmm? uh, so several sessions, we have all the transactions, and we keep. Hmm? So once it's finished the market, then we send the feedback, which tells two the buyer, hmm, that he bought a fees for 12 euros, he had hmm, a buyer value of 25, so his profit is 13. For the seller, hmm, it says that it bought, he sold a, a, a fees for 12, he had already spent 10, so his profit is 2. Hmm? And then we can move to the next round. Okay? So we could go through all the rounds. One of the interesting things, with classics is that you can see what happened in the past. Hmm? So you can go to previous results, and for example, here I can see, hmm? so this is what I did in classroom of 29, or hmm? so Francesco, so these are at Pompeu Fabra, huh? but you see that they are hmm? in many other places. So for example, in this classroom, I can go back, hmm? and I see other people's, hmm? whenever you want to make it public, other people's experiences, so I can see beforehand, hmm, so we don't have to do the whole thing. So this one, uh, actually this is not a good one because it has only one round, so let me just go to this one, okay? So in this one, we did the first round, and this is the actual, huh? this is from, from last September, no, last, uh, this was probably October. Hmm? So this is what happened, hmm? In the classroom, different transactions. Uh, we go to round two. Round three was not necessary, and then we move to, to session two. You actually can see the transactions as they happen, and you can see that hmm, you can click some of them. So this, is, this was round one. Hmm? So equilibrium price here was 20. Hmm? So uh, in round two, you see, and that's what Antonio was, was showing. So really, hmm, people, by talking to each other, so you get these this, this, this results of, of people moving eh, closer to 20. Now, when we move to session to, uh, to, to session two, in session two, what happens? Hmm, and let me show you, and that's the other thing you can get. Let me show you the predictions. Hmm, so this one you don't show beforehand. Hmm? So in session one, the equilibrium price is 20. In the session two, what we do is we flood the market with fish. Okay? So at the beginning, all the students are super happy because, you know, before the price was 20, now I have three fish, I'm going to be super rich, and my, you know, my profits are going uh, 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 to skyrocket. Okay? What they don't realize is that actually we are flooding the market and the price is going down to zero. Uh, what we see, so if you go now... Hmm? to the chart, and you see the first round hmm, of session two, hmm, at the beginning there is this inertia. Hmm? So everybody wants to, hmm, to get these 20 euros, and of course there are people who don't realize that now there are a lot of fees, a lot of demanders, so they still keep buying at 20 euros. But very clearly hmm, in time, people realize that there are a lot of fees, and at the end people who waited 
mm, they end up buying to almost to almost zero. Okay? So if you do more rounds, what you see is that this tends to go. There are people who still get a stick to this mm, to these 20 euros, but you see the sharp. Mm, so they learn very quickly. Mm. So you don't get exactly zero as the equilibrium because that's mm, so this is giving it for free, but but it matches really well what the what the theory says. Okay? So all this we use it mm, during the during the experiment. So these are the, the type of tools. And you also have mm, what are the averages for each round, what's the minimum, what's the maximum, what's the median, standard deviations, mm, and, and and the quantities. Okay? So this is the, the instrument mm, the instrument we have. Mm, uh, I'm never very good at this thing of changing from one to the other. Okay? So once we have done the experiment, and in, during the experiment, and that's the other thing that is important, during the experiment, there is discussion eh, before, during, and after the experiment, during the, during the session. Uh, after that, what you do is you get data from, uh, from students, from, from the experiment. So once you have finished your experiment, so if we go back to the to this result I just show you. So the second thing you can do is you can go to data and you can download the data as an Excel file. So let me just give you, rather than downloading this, let me just give you what this data looks like. So this is all the data, which is all the contracts, and here we have mm, identifications. Mm, so in our case, we have this external ID, mm, which allows us to identify the, the students. It's not necessary, mm, but we use it for, for the payoffs. And what we have is that with this data, mm, we create mm, another spreadsheet that inputs this data into a uh, so it has the instructions of how to, how to put this data. You just give this name mm, to the file, and then you generate automatically what is the data you are providing to students and actually the answers to the problems that you are asking them to do. Okay? So in this particular case, so if we go back mm, to, the, to the students to the student <coughs> notes, mm, so the second part of the, the student's instructions is once, hmm? so this is the, the instructions for after, after the experiment. So after the experiments, you tell them what are the, the learning objectives, what are the pre prerequisites they need to do the exercise. Hmm? Ideally, here you see it as a PDF. Hmm? Uh, the idea is that this should be online and you should have all kind of, of links. And then you have exercises hmm? asking, hmm? what to do which you get the solutions with the particular data and you can use the particular data of the experiment or from previous from previous from previous experiments okay uh, Roger, yes do you, have, do, you have, do you have to run this live in a lecture could you just run it over the course of a week so with the student participating as, a, as, a, as an offline exercise you could uh, you could do it I, this, I think it depends on the experiment so this experiment doesn't make a lot of sense Mm, because, well, you need to, to know who's there. Mm. So, or you could make... Oh, they, have, they, have to actually talk. they have to talk in this particular experiment. There are experiments that you can do offline, or you could do, mm, so, and, and that depends on you could do in, in a huge, with a huge audience. So there is an experiment of network externalities where I'm, so I own a phone, mm, and the value of the phone for you depends on how many people end up buying the phone. Okay? So in this experiment, so this one I've done it with... I don't remember, but probably 200 or 300 students. And you can do it. Hmm? So because you are announcing things and people just have to say whether they want to buy or not. Hmm? And what you see is actually these dynamics hmm? of, of at the beginning nobody wants to buy it. It's only people who has a very high initial value, so the, a very intrinsic value for the phone. And then as a few people hmm, start buying, you pass the, the, the threshold, you get the minimum that you need in order to, to get all the demand. And then you see 
all the buying mm -hmm. happening and, and all the transaction moving moving really fast. So that depends depends on the on the particular experiment. So uh, so this is mm, the type of mm, the approach and the material uh, and, uh, that, that we want to take. Uh, so for the instructor, mm, what we have is first the idea of, mm, so it could be for each experiment what are the key concepts, what are the objectives, what are the prerequisites that the students need in if they want to do the, the experiment because the way we see is that each experiment has an isolate experience. Mm? So you could run, as we do, the whole course based on experiments. Mm? So every section starts with an experiment. You could incorporate these experiments in your own, in your own course. Okay? Uh, and then there is mm, this introduction, a capsule instructions, just in case you have run the experiments in the past and you just want to refresh what are the instructions, so everything is it's collected in this capsule. Otherwise, you have detailed instructions of how much time you, as, you do, what you have to do in every single, in every single session with predictions and discussions, mm, and ideally this could be mm, extended, mm, as well as the explanation of what is the companion material. And the companion material are the warm-up exercises in class X, so for each for each one of the experiments, what we use is a warm-up exercise. So the warm-up exercises, in the case of the fish market, hmm, they are based on the warm-up that the students had. So these warm-up exercises, we use them at the beginning of the, of, of the experiment as a way to incentivize the students to read the instructions beforehand. So it's very easy, they are very easy questions. It, they just test, so in particular, the first question just test whether they read and they know that there is this fixed cost of, of, of 10 euros. If they don't know about this fixed cost, they cannot get the first question right. Okay? So what we do to motivate the students to, to be prepared for the experiment, which means reading one page, is we say participating in the experiment has a reward in terms of, of grading, that could be attendance, but this attendance is conditional on what's the grade you get in this. Hmm? So in particular, there are four questions. You, you need to get three out of four right. If you don't get three out of four right, you don't get the credit for attendance because you came here, but you didn't read the material. Okay? There is a second part that depends the grade on what's your performance in the experiment. And there we are a little bit more sophisticated, right? Because you can get a good type, you can get a bad type, so, it's, so you have to compensate good for bad, so you take an average, and it's in comparison with, so it's, it's more sophisticated, the rule, uh, because, <clears throat> as Antonio said, life, <coughs> life is, not always, hmm? is not always fair, so I could be very, hmm? I get very bad types all the time, and that should not influence my, my grade, but what we do is, it's, it's only 5% of the grade, you take an average, and at the end, it's very, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that someone will get a bad, uh, their grades will, will go down because hmm, of bad performance. Sometimes their grades go down, but it's because they don't show up, hmm, or they don't do, hmm, they don't read the, 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 the instructions. Uh, grades is one way to use motivation. The other thing I found is that, so these are first year, first quarter students, so sometimes reputation is a great motivation. Okay, so they want to, sh I mean, they don't want to be the ones who don't get high profits. Or, hmm? So usually the problem usually is not so much how to motivate them, but how to demotivate them a little bit because they take it a little bit too seriously. Hmm? And, and sometimes the, the classroom heats up a little bit too much. Okay, so especially when they are, huh, they are monopoly cartels or something like that, that's... that's uh, Mm -hmm. and, and we have one where we have a monopoly, or we, have, we have a cartel that is non-binding, and then, of course, we separate them, and each one is in a room, and you have, uh, imagine, you have four students, one in each corner of the room, and then there is all the rest, they are pressuring one of them, saying, if you lower the price, we'll, no, we all buy it to you, 
and the other ones they cannot say anything because if they communicate, we say, look, we got it, that you are, hmm? you are, con you are talking to each other, and then we will find you. Hmm? Uh, no, no, they cannot, they cannot do <laughs> because what I say is, and that, and that's actually, hmm? so this is a good. I know it's not, uh, it was not in the in the structure, but I think it's a good excuse to talk about about this. So, this give us, for example, the opportunity to talk about antitrust policies. So why, it's not something we had in mind because it's not part of the program, but usually comes up from the experiment hmm? because there is, sometimes before the monopoly. Hmm? So even in some of these experiments, people start saying, oh, let's get all together. And, and then I have to say, no, 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 look, we are trying to describe a model with a lot of people here. We are not that many buyers, that many sellers, but you will not be able to do that. And then I ask them, so if this happens, so what happens in real life? Hmm? What happens when people then, and somebody comes up and say, oh, there is the antitrust policy. So there is, hmm? and then you start talking about this. So the experiment beyond what hmm, you have the lines here and what's the discussion, it gives you the opportunity to talk about many, many things. So the case of the fish, and I don't have time to go through all the details of, of the fish market. So the fish market, we like it because it's counterintuitive, the result. Hmm? So uh, at the beginning, everybody thought that if I get more fish, I should be better off. So in this uh, particular experiment, I get more fish, and actually I, I end up losing. So, so equilibrium price is zero, so everybody ends up, hmm? so if you do hmm, two in the second, and, and for sure in the third round, all the fishers, they end up losing money hmm? when they got more fish than than in the first round. And then this allow us to talk about, well, how could we solve this? And many students, mm, so we have some description of mm, uh, uh, people burning crops or throwing the fish back to the, to the sea. And then the, there is interesting discussions about, well, should it be better to give it away rather than destroy it? Should we give it to developing countries who could... Mm, and it's not clear what's the, what's the solution because then somebody, come, uh, somebody else comes and says, well, but then you are exporting your problem to, to this other country and, and, no? uh, and the agriculture no? uh, sector there is the one who's going to suffer. And many times the only thing you have to do after the experiment is to guide a little bit the conversation and particularly to avoid that the conversation becomes a, you know, a path conversation. Okay, so, it's, so it keeps a certain level, huh? and not everybody tends to, hmm, to say whatever it crosses their mind, hmm, while at the same time they are incentive to, to, to participate. So uh, let me just, hmm, so with the hmm, time I have, I, I have left, let me just give you a brief description. Hmm? Uh, so this is, this is the other material I told you. Hmm, I had, oh, and the, and the last thing we do is if you want to go further. So if you just want to use the experiment, you could use it this way, right? But now, suppose that you really want to know what's behind the experiment, then we have the technical detail that describes how the roles are distributed in a classroom. So who becomes, of how many fish, fishers you end up, how many, what's the distribution of buyer values. Uh, as well, uh, uh, of course, uh, what are the different Mm? possibilities of the warm-up exercises. Because the warm-up exercises, mm? the ones they get in their phone before the experiment, they are personalized. So they change from student to student. So not everybody gets the same solution. So there are some seeds. Mm? So and we also explain how, how this thing works mm? for the, for the, for the warm-up mm? beforehand and what they, what they get. Okay? So this is a mm? particular case where no? for, for this, uh, the results you get after the warm-up exercises. Mm? So what you get is in the first one, hmm, there were 33 people who, hmm, and, and it's interesting that it gets in both cases the same. So the first two questions were about, do you remember this 10, no, this 10 pound or this 10 euro uh, fixed cost? So there were one third of the class who didn't, I mean, they read it, but they didn't read it hmm, well enough to remember that. Uh, this one was the, the, was the easy question. Hmm? about whether I want to, hmm, to buy if there are a lot of sellers or, or, or very, uh, so if I want to buy, what's the price I can expect hmm, if there are a lot of sellers or, or, or very few sellers? And the last one tend to be a little bit 
a little bit hard. Hmm? So that's why we request, we ask for, for, three, for three out of four. Hmm? But you see that it's, it's kind of consistent that one third hmm, of the classroom didn't, didn't, read, uh, didn't read this. And that gives me also the opportunity to say, do I need to spend time explaining the experiment or can I go directly to the experiment? So it really speeds up hmm, the process very fast. So let me go in the time I have left, let me go to, to what is more content. Okay, control this. Uh, okay, uh, let me see where I am. Too many windows. Okay, here. Hmm? So, so this is the case of the fish market. So what do you get? Hmm? The fish market, that's why we say you, you get the real-time transactions, you get the deliberation. Hmm? material that helps you hmm, to talk about the experiment in the classroom. And let me just give you a list of what are the experiments hmm, that we use, not all of them. Eh? I excluded the labor market for obvious reasons. Uh, but a list of experiments and what are the possible connections with the economy. Hmm? And that's the part that I think, it, that I think it, it's interesting. So, so we have hmm, the Apple market. So this is the supply and demand market. Mm? They, they have to buy and sell uh, a bushel of apples. So it's exactly the same as, as the, the experiment that Antonio explained. The fish market is the one mm? I described. And what they talk is about this mm? market mm? equilibrium, which is, would be related to the idea of mm? supply and demand and shifts in the curves. Uh, so we have an experiment with taxis, which could be connected to the, to the idea of the effect of taxis. So it's, it's more focused, no? this experiment on taxis is more focused on, uh, on the dead weight loss hmm? inefficiencies of taxation. Hmm? We have an experiment on pollution, taxis, and permits, which I think I like better. So I think this taxis is a good excuse in order to, to explain. Hmm? So, so I like, and that's something that I, I always emphasize as students, and in the taxis experiments I do, is that you cannot talk about taxes without saying what you are going to do with the taxes. Okay? So I like much better hmm? so in this, uh, to connect taxes with, with, with pollution. And there, is a, there are actually permits. So there is a, this is kind of fairly more sophisticated experiment where there are two markets. There is the market of the good. Hmm? It's, a polluting, it's a polluting good. <coughs> and there is a market for permits. Hmm? So the class divides in, this, in these two markets. Uh, we have monopoly and cartels, so and, mm, and I told so monopoly is mm, so it's, it's, it's an exercise, it's not really mm, an experiment, but then there are, there are cartels and there are competing mm, monopolies. And, and there are actually price, there is also an example of price discrimination where you have students and non-students. And then we have network externalities, and I like, and this is the, this is the experiment we use for the last class. Mm. So, and I like a lot network externalities, the, it has two parts, this experiment. So the first part is about this selling this new phone. Mm? We call it the holophone mm? because it gives a holographic image. Mm? But you can only talk to people who have exactly the same, the same phone. So I like it because you can connect it with everything that's happening mm? in, in, in their phones, actually. Mm? So you can connect it with Instagram, you can connect it with WhatsApp, with Facebook, and then you can make connections between uh, why different standards survive and why others die. And mm, so it's, 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 it's a good connection. And also because then in the theory it allows us to introduce and talk about dynamics and stable and unstable in equilibria and students understand it. Mm. So we are talking, so this course, I should have said at the beginning, this is a 10 week course. So it's really fast, it's really short, so we cannot cover a lot of material. Without this, I could not be, no, it could be harder, no, definitely much harder, to introduce the idea of dynamics, mm, uh, introduce the idea of a stable, unstable equilibria and selection of equilibria, and the concept that sometimes the theory gives you one equilibria, most times the I mean, you don't have to have many equilibria and you have to be able to select and you don't know which one mm, may happen. Of course, we don't enter into the math of it, but we have a, a regret demand curve, and they really get it from the, from the experiment, okay? Now, Classics has many, many other experiments that we don't use. Uh, so there is a principle, and here I, I have reversed 
the order. Mm? So here I'm talking about what are the topics in, in, in the economy that I think mm, would benefit from some of the experiments that exist in classics. Okay? So these other experiments don't have all the material mm, that I have explained about this one. Well, I would say they don't have it yet, mm, and that's my, my hope. But there is a principal agent mm, experiment. There is a prisoner's dilemma experiment. There is an ultimatum game experiment. There is a, a, a matrix game, generic matrix game experiment that you can use for mm, a generic and you can, as, eh, as a structure, you have a parameters and you can say what are the values in each one of the cells of the, of the payoffs of the cells of the experiment and then use it mm, for social interactions, conflict and so on as equilibria. There is a repeated public good experiment as well uh, and there is an interest rate tender game experiment. Don't ask me about this one. I don't know it mm, because it's, mm, I, haven't, I haven't worked on this, on this yet. Okay? And there is also a Keynesian multiplier experiment. Okay? So these last two I haven't mm, worked on them but I was going and with, uh, with Marcus mm, Yamatei who's the, the person in, in uh, Passau University mm, who's the the site on classics, so the, the ones that we found that could be connected. And I think there could be, there could be many more. So let me just give you some last comments. So the first is that experiments engage students mm, and facilitate the understanding of abstract concepts. So what we found is that concepts, mm, even mm, in the old framework, concepts like equilibrium, concepts like stable and stable dynamics are easier to understand once you have seen it once you have been in the market. Uh, but running an experiment is not enough. You cannot just run an experiment and then everybody had a lot of fun and then you go home. If you really want to take everything out of experiments, you need discussions before, during, and after the experiment and force students to think and reflect about what they have experienced. Mm? And ideally to have some kind of material that help them mm, in their thinking, okay? So student, uh, experiments must be accompanied by tasks that you know, analyze and think and ideally mm, make students find the, the, the results by themselves rather than, mm, than giving them to them, okay? And connecting with the beginning, I think experiments also introduce a dynamic that keeps the professor alert and makes teaching a fun experience. So some years, hmm, I've been teaching the same experiments two days in a row for six times. Hmm? So six different groups, same experiment. Uh, the sixth one, I was tired, but it's always a little bit different. There are always different questions. There are always people hmm, who act differently. There are things that come up in one session, not the other. Hmm? I don't recommend yeah, running the same experiment six times, huh? but uh, what I can say is that if instead of an experiment had been a theory class, the third one I would be dead. Hmm? So I would, yeah, as Antonio said, I would commit suicide. Okay? So, and, and the last thing is that here, and that's something I want to emphasize, technology here was demand driven. Hmm? So it's not that there is this technology and I have to use it. Actually, we were using experiments, we were using this approach much before the technology. The technology allows for basically three important things. The first one is it saves a lot of time. In the classroom, it gives more time for debate, and more time for discussion. It, it saves a lot of time on collecting the data because everything is already there. Uh, technology it also helps in increasing the size of the classroom. Hmm? So, you could do these experiments with 80 students. Mm? So we've run, actually, we've run these experiments from as little as five students, and don't ask me how I manage, mm, to classes of 50 and 60 students. Some of the experiments, there is no limit. Mm? And, 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 and if, you know, if you are interested, I can go, uh, you can go also to classics, and, and you find that there are experiments that have been run with hundreds of students. Mm? Uh, and, and, and the last thing with the, with the 
with the technology, with the phones, is that it feels closer to students. Mm? So the big, uh, and, and I conclude with that, so the, the big threat or the, or the big concern that everybody has is that when a student has a phone in their hands, then there, there is always the temptation mm, to go somewhere else mm, and, you know, leave the class without being, eh, eh, while being still present there, okay? So what we do and what we say, and it's true, mm, well, like we say partially true, mm, is that if they have other apps open, they can get kicked out of class X. Okay, so there is a chance that you may leave the experiment and then don't complain that, oh, look, I got logged out and I cannot log in and so on, because if you have hmm, these cases, it's very unlikely, <laughs> but there are many phones and many apps. So it's, it's, there is always a tiny probability that if you open this particular app and in particular delete the cookies, then you get locked out, okay? So that usually helps. Hmm? So it's not 100% proof, but, but usually helps. And so just to also give some credit to, to Ted Bergstrom, hmm? let me say this quote that I like a lot that says, <laughs> eh, taking a course in experimental economics, it's a little like going to a dinner at the cannibal's house sometimes. Hmm? You will be the dinner, sometimes you will be part of the dinner, and sometimes both. And, and that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>